Hello, everyone. My name is Lori Stansel. I am the founder and director of Practical Living Ministries based in the U.S. And I want to welcome you to the very first segment of our Let's Talk Faith series. In this series, we're going to be talking to women from all over the world, and we're going to be featuring them, not just with their accomplishments, but what they've had to struggle with and what walking in faith means to them. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our very first guest, Charissa Monroe. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. Hi. So now we're going to read your bio and then we'll jump right in. So Charissa Monroe is an influential, world-renowned, motivational speaker with a vision to promote a world where you love yourself and others, act from your heart, and lead by serving your gifts, which is really powerful. She shares the foundational message of purpose and hope passed down to her by her legendary parents, Drs. Miles and Ruth Monroe. She currently serves as, a, as president of the Miles and Ruth Monroe Foundation and vice president of Monroe Global Inc. And if that wasn't enough, she also serves as president and CEO of Charissa Monroe LLC, a personal brand company that serves to empower lives and help others to define, develop, and deploy their purpose for greatness. Wow. <laughs> I thought I was busy. Girl, you get it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Again, thank you for joining the Let's Talk Faith series or Practical Living Ministries. And I'm going to jump right in with the first question. So your speaking and your teaching ministry really is so impactful. I follow you on Facebook, you and your brother, and I'm so proud of you guys. I mean, just what you're doing is amazing. And it's so impactful. And you come from such a legendary line of speakers growing up in that household with your parents, did you always know that this is what you wanted to do? So the show out and direct answer to that question is no. <laughs> okay. It was not a part of the plan. What was the plan was my brother and I were going to serve with my parents. Okay. And it was, it was set up to be in capacities of us being behind the scenes, um, making sure that they're able to do what they do in the forefront. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were pretty much the shoulders that I can stand on. Okay. We um, were in the background making sure that the little things were done so that he can focus on just being the gift. Mm -hmm. um, and the issues. We were, so that was my place. Um, as PR, in the last three years of his ministry before he passed, our responsibility was to do a lot of introductions of his products. Okay. And um, so that's pretty much as far as the forefront as, as I got. Okay. But believe it or not, clearly my dad and God had a, another vision that they didn't care to tell me about <laughs> mm. until later. Yeah. Because my dad was doing what he does best. And, you know, and I say this very loosely, but I say it all the time. He used to throw my brother and I to the wolves from we were kids. Wow. We travel with him and my mom all the time. And one of his things was two things. He always introduced his family. Okay. So he made a big, he made a big deal about my mom. He made sure that he presented her to the world. And then he did the same thing with me and my brother. Presented wow. us to the world. When he did that, though, the same mic that he put in my mom's face to say a couple of words is the same mic that he gave up. <laughs> uh-huh. No matter how much we pleaded. And we petitioned before we, you know, <laughs> to wherever we were going, dad, please don't call us up. Please don't have us say nothing. And, you know, he would say, okay, but no, it didn't <laughs> happen. And, you know, so he was, so from six, seven, eight, all the way up, he would have us say something. And it was always just greet the people. And so, you know, at that time we knew a few things. We knew that we couldn't embarrass him. <laughs> okay. And we sure couldn't embarrass ourselves. Right. So we would say something. And, um, you know, there's something could be anything, but nonetheless, I mean, we were nervous, we would start sweating, but, 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 you know, even then we never said no, like, like we never on stage said no, mm -hmm. he gave you the mic, you said something. Yeah. And as I grow older, I still didn't like it, mm -hmm. but after being around him and being around the ministry and being around that life for so long. It's ingrained in you. So as soon as my brother and I would open our mouth, 
I think we used to surprise him. <laughs> so no, it was not in the cards that I had in, in my hand at the time. But, you know, in the, the Bible says many of uh, the plants in a man's heart, but it's God that prevail. And so, like I said, he and clearly he knew something that, that we didn't know because he was preparing right, for right. greater. I, and I always say he was preparing us for such a time as this. Yes, indeed. Indeed he was. Indeed he was. Did you wrestle with any sort of insecurities though? Because I mean, everyone's like, okay, this is Miles' daughter, so she's got to bring it. Did you feel that pressure at all? So there was always pressure. And even before now, there was pressure of, from us just being PKs and Miles Monroe's children mm -hmm. back home, like in the Bahamas, growing up in, in, in school you know mm -hmm. so people you know people in the church they look at you a certain way they treat you a certain way then they have their expectations yeah. and they're watching you mm. you know they're watching to see what you're doing i okay. mean we, we had to be careful wherever we went and you know we're typical high school kids uh -huh. so you know we may have gone to a party you may have gone in the club and you got to be careful you go hey oh we saw charo and Teresa. <laughs> you, know, you know people this whatever yeah. so <laughs> Even then, though, my, my dad just taught us to, people are going to talk no matter what. Yeah. No, you don't want to give them something to talk about. But understand that, you know, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but this is the life that you have. Mm -hmm. And so people are going to be watching. Mm -hmm. And um, you just kind of be, you have to just, just have to make sure you're careful of what you're listening to. And so, you know, we knew that the pressure was heavy. It, we felt it. Yeah. Even more so now, the pressure is still Interesting. People are watching. Yeah. Their expectations. Yeah. They're trying to see, you know, are we going to fail? Or are we going to succeed? Mm -hmm. um, you still can't go any and everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and people are watching. Yeah. But again, that is, you know, those are expectations that, uh, that if you're not careful, could be limitations. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I already have expectations of myself. So God forbid if I bring anybody else's expectations there. Mm hmm but I think one of the biggest pressures that I have is just making sure that I make my parents proud mm -hmm. and make sure that I don't, um, you know, my dad's legacy and the leader that he was is going to be, it's going to stand for something yes. based on what my brother and I do at this point. Right. He's done his part, but him doing his part is only going to be evident if the people that he influenced are able to kind of run with it. Absolutely. And so for me to fail is for, is for dad to fail. Absolutely. For me to fail is for my mom to fail. For me to mess up mm -hmm. is for them to fail and mess up and for their leadership to mean nothing. Mm -hmm. And so that's pressure enough. Right. And that's more pressure now because they're, they are with the Lord. So it's not like they can come behind you and say, okay, let's start again. You know, yeah. <laughs> they've done the it all. So you, yeah. yeah biggest challenges as far as insecurities and then those insecurities are just stuff that I battle with within myself and, and they're more personal insecurities than they mm -hmm. are anything else to do with um ministry or anything you know one of the insecurities that I have and I think every female has it is you know you want to look a certain way yeah and so if I am to be honest and open and candid I'm always wanting to make sure that I'm and that I look right and I'm fit and you know, so you gain 10, you lose 10, gain 10, lose 10. Story of my life. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You don't, don't, don't want to be walking around <laughs> like a chocolate chip cookie, but uh, <laughs> or chunky. Uh, granted, I love chocolate chip cookies. Mm, my favorites. Um, so, you know, I'm always doing something to make sure that I'm looking a certain way because, because again, people are watching. Yes. So there's this image that I have to make sure that, um, you know, I, I keep up. And that's just, you know, part of the kingdom as well. You know, you can't just be looking a certain way, but yet you're saying, I'm a mm -hmm. part of this kingdom. But exactly. then you're looking like you don't, you know, there's no excellence, there's no perfection mm -hmm. about yourself. So Yeah, I, I, I can relate to some degree, obviously, not to, to what you're going through fully. But I grew up, my grandfather was my pastor and my bishop. So... Um, and being one of three granddaughters, all boys. So there was a focus on us as, as the granddaughters. And so he would always put that, put us out there. And so it put that pressure on us, like, okay, you better not mess up because granddad's gonna find out, granddad's gonna know. And I remember one time I said to him, he said to me, no, he said, you know, Lori, you're called of God. 
And there are certain things that you just can't do. Not that they're wrong, not that they're sinful, but you just can't do them. And I'm like, but I want to. <laughs> and he was like, well, you can't. I said, well, then I don't want to be called. And I remember him saying to me, well, it doesn't work that way. Mm. You're called and that's it. So I certainly can relate to, to that aspect of it. If of you saying, okay, wait, but I'm a kid. I want to be a kid. I want to have fun. I want to do these things that aren't necessarily bad, but because you have a mandate on your life and a calling on your life and you have a legacy to carry, those things are, are kind of off limits to you and people like you. So it can be sometimes even a lonely road as well, I have found. But God is faithful. He, he does put people in your circle that can bless you and speak into you and encourage you on a, in a deep way. So I am thankful for that. Yes. So let me go on to the next question. So this kind of piggybacks about, um, about people watching us and, and watching you per se. Now, when your parents transitioned to glory, everybody was watching you. You didn't have the luxury of saying, okay, I'm going to grieve in private and then I'll come back and talk to you. <laughs> you. You didn't necessarily have that luxury that we all have or people that aren't in the spotlight have. And people see the glory and they don't know the story. So walking through your own healing and, and getting to a place of wholeness in God after that happened, how has your outlook changed with your life and with ministry and with your business? You know, one of the things I realized very quickly when everything happened was life really is short. Yes. And we don't have the time that we think we have mm. to take our time in, oh, I'll get to my purpose later, or, oh, I'll get to figuring it out later. Yeah. No, we don't. Like, we literally, tomorrow is not promised to us. Mm -hmm. And so with that said, you know, you'll be surprised how much life death will give you. Mm. Especially. Wow. And so that's, that's exactly what happened with my parents. Okay. Um, you know, my dad used to always say in his teachings, you know, he'll say whatever he said. He'll make a very good principle, a very good point. And, you know, the room would be quiet. And at that moment, everyone should have been jumping up and down and clapping. Mm -hmm. And he would always say, you know what, y'all don't get it when I'm gone. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is very right. You know, there are a lot of things that he said that you, we just did not get until he was gone. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, his messages on purpose and potential and vision and destiny, like, that is very real now. It's more real for me now than it was because... Now he's, he's not here anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have that comfort. Mm -hmm. I don't have that um, person to look up to, to, well, not to look up to, but I don't have that person to, you know, I, I can ride on his coat. Yes. Yes. Um, I don't have that person to depend on and rely on like I was before. Now I realize that it's really just me and God. Mm. And, and Teresa, what are you going to do? And so, you know, when they pass, my brother and I, because of this life, we really didn't have that moment and that time to grieve like mm -hmm. everyone would. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, people grieve differently. Yes. I would have loved to have been able to go and hide under a rock and find an inhabited island and just be left alone. Mm -hmm. And just kind of cry as long as I wanted and hurt and just leave me alone. But that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. And I could have done that, but I can do that and then still say, but I'm going to continue my parents' legacy. The two would not work. Mm. I can't I couldn't do that but then also say God yes I'm gonna take this mantle and do what you would have me do the two cannot exist together yes and so I can only say that it's been because of the grace the grace and strength of God that I've been able to do his work and do this legacy work and carry the baton it's only because of his strength that I'm able to do that and still figure out how to maneuver through this grieving process Yes. And it's been very difficult behind the scenes. It's been very challenging. Mm -hmm. People don't know that. They don't see that because I had to smile. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be strong for everybody. Yes. But behind the scenes, it's, 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 it's rough. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. when I'm behind the scenes, I'm actually, I'm usually behind the scenes by myself. Okay. Okay. Um, in my own thoughts, in my own head, no one understands the hurt, no one understands the pain. Mm -hmm. People probably look and say, oh, four years later, they're fine. Actually, no, four years later, it feels just like yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, God continues to give the strength 
and the joy and the persistence and determination and grace that I need to yeah. do what he would have me do, his will. Right. right. And saying yes to that comes with its challenges, but what he calls for, he provides for. Absolutely. And so he knows what I need. He knows who I need. Yeah. So yes, he's brought a lot of who's into my life to help yeah. uh, carry me as I carry this. Mm, baton. And um, so I thank him. I thank him. I mean, I literally am to the point where I can't trust in man anymore. Like mm -hmm. he's the only person that I can depend on. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And I, I connect in such a, a way because you're, you know, your the passing of your father was so much more than just the passing of your father, because he was your father, he was your pastor, he was your mentor, he was your boss. He filled so many roles that typically are filled by different people. Exactly. And so he was he he encompassed such a large part of your life. You and so your brother. Imagine the layers of grief. Yes, and because you and you're grieving for your father, but you're grieving for your boss. You're grieving for you know you're grieving in those layers, and within that, you still have to carry on in ministry. You still have to function. You still have to show up, and and allow the Holy Spirit to use you. And I would imagine that now you have a greater appreciation of God's presence because you know without his presence you couldn't do it no at all not because exactly Teresa, in the human sense would be like i'm done <laughs> you guys sorry read the bible for yourself okay because <laughs> i'm done but you understood the the weight of of carrying that burden and it reminds me of the scripture where when christ was trying to grieve the passing of john the baptist and he was trying to find a quiet spot to grieve and the people found him mm -hmm. and he was like, okay, well, all right, you know, but to whom much is given, much is required. And I do believe that when we say yes to God, even in our pain, God's grace amplifies in our life. And like you said, he sends the who's to help lift up your arms. Mm -hmm. and, and in those seasons of reprieve, you're then allowed to process the emotional aspects of grief. So I love how you, how you express that. I think people are going to really connect to that. I know I connected to that just in my own, my own personal walk and in my own personal journey. Uh, let me ask you this question. So what's the most significant change that you've experienced in your heart when you said yes? Because you said earlier that, you know, you had, you had to say yes to God, even in the grief. So what was a significant change in your life when you said yes in obedience to God? So the, so the, the beginning of this is the tail end of what we talked about two minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before everything, you know, I had my dad there. I was fine doing what we were doing behind the scenes, in the backdrop. No one had to see us if they didn't need to. And I was comfortable. Yeah. Um, if I didn't say yes, then I can just kind of do what I want to do and grieve the way I want and not be seen for years and years. Mm -hmm. And who knows what would, have, what would have happened. Right. But saying yes now changes my life significantly because now I'm uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Completely uncomfortable. This was not a part of my, my plan for my life. Mm -hmm. This was not the vision that I had for my life. Um, what we the vision we had as a family was we would do this together for people think okay okay now we are two people mm -hmm. that wasn't what you know so so i'm two we're two people carrying the exact same weight that mm -hmm. four people were supposed to carry going forward mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then I, and then i don't have anyone like i don't have them there to back up back me up i don't have them there to be the foundation to be the pillars of strength so right. now I'm moving sometimes by myself and I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. Everything is new now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so in saying yes, then I'm also having to accept whatever that yes comes with. So whatever responsibility, whatever the task, whatever the assignment is, whoever the assignments are, I have to accept that. I can't just say partial yes, but then say no to everything else. <laughs> that's all that's this is all uncomfortable uncharted territory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so now i don't i mean i, I don't know what to do mm -hmm. so now i'm having to literally depend on the holy spirit yes. to 
Now, okay, so I, I said yes, but you got to take me. My yes literally did come with a condition. <laughs> yeah. You know, I will do this, but you need to be there every step of the way. I will do this, but I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't until I said yes for real, for real, that I realized, okay, so I'm a little more prepared than I thought I was. Mm -hmm. uh, because my dad had been preparing and investing and preparing and investing and mentoring and teaching me from I was a child all the way up to the day that he passed. And some of it was intentional, some of it was direct, and some wasn't. Okay. But in retrospect, I, I can feel it. I can see it. Mm. But I'm still uncomfortable. Mm. So I'm uncomfortable. So now there are more, probably more insecurities, because now I'm afraid to fail. Okay. Now there's a little fear of, I'm not going to be able to do it the way he did. Okay. And then people are now really wanting you to, is she going to be able to do Fill, her, fill his shoes. Well, I don't want to fill his shoes. Mm -hmm. Those shoes are ever too big to fill. <laughs> but I can, I can follow the footsteps. Yes. And I can kind of build my own shoes. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to always say, you know, I used to always say it even when my dad was very much alive and I was introducing him. And I would say, you know, I want to be, I don't want to be like my dad. Um, I want to be better than him. Mm -hmm. I want to be greater than him. And so maybe I may have been setting myself up and didn't know. Didn't know. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you have to be careful what you ask for. Yes. Because you can get it. Mm -hmm. But when you ask for something like that, that comes with sacrifice. Absolutely. And so in being uncomfortable, I'm also growing. And you know the saying, you know, there's no growth that happens or that occurs in, com in, just in, in comfort. That's right. But you don't, you don't grow until you are uncomfortable. You don't grow until you've actually torn a muscle and then given it time to repair. That's you true. don't strengthen with just doing a 10 pounds for eight weeks. No, by week four, five, six, you, you should have been to 25 pounds. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that tearing and repairing and tearing and repairing and pain and discomfort, it's what's allowing you to get stronger and stronger mm -hmm. in that muscle in your arm. Really and so the uncomfortable part is exactly that uncomfortable, but I am growing. I am maturing, you know, I've had to grow up overnight mm. since 2014 and, uh, it's, you know, still new territory. I'm still learning, but I'm not, I'm not alone. No. Uh, I really do depend on God. And I do believe that, um, the Holy spirit guides and he sends exactly, I mean, the right amount of people. Mm -hmm. the perfect amount of people in my life over the last four years to, to help, to mm -hmm. assist, to guide. And, um, it's, 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 it's amazing. Yeah, it absolutely is. And it's just a reminder that there's nothing that could happen in our life that will catch God off guard. You know, he's, <laughs> he's not on his throne saying, Oh, I didn't see that coming. You know, <laughs> we might be like that, but he's, fully aware and has a contingency plan for everything. And so it just kind of reminds me that we just have to trust him even in the pain. And I think about just all the things that you've been able to do since that time and how being pushed out before you thought you were ready or before you wanted to do it or before you desired to do it, it caused you to create things that are leaving your footprint. So you're carrying your father's legacy but you're doing it in a way that sounds like you, that looks like you. And, and it's wonderful. Those things would have never been released into the earth had you not had to go forward in this way with this intensity. So you can see God's hand moving in, in, in all of it. And it's very true. There's, there's, it's true that I would not have, I would not have blossomed. Mm -hmm. I would not have busted out of my shell for as long as my dad was here because I was comfortable. I was comfortable. I was easy. It, it was easy. You know, my purpose at that point in my mind was to carry him and my mom. And we do this together. And we, we, as, as the ministry grow, we grow. But, um, you know, God knew that this girl, this woman, this child of mine is not going to be her full potential mm -hmm. as long as her wow. parents are there. Wow. And, um, and it's true. Yeah. It's true. And so now I'm at a, you know, I'm, I'm at a point where they really aren't here. So Sharissa, what are you, what are you going to do? Like life is short. Tomorrow is not promised to you. And so are you, so again, 
you'd be surprised how much life there is in death mm. Mm -hmm. and how much life without a purpose. Like it was at that moment when I realized, so the fact that I'm still here, mm -hmm. my dad always says, the fact that I'm still here means that there's still something left for me to do. Absolutely. Or else I would have been, the, the story would have been true when they said, Miles Monroe, wife and daughter right. were a part of this fatal accident, right. but that wasn't the case. Right, right, right. I'm still very much here. So that means, Charissa, there's something you need to do and you need to get on it yesterday, like now. Exactly. And it's, it's like there's an urgency that you feel because you're like, life is so valuable. I don't want to squander a minute of it because I know, like you said, tomorrow is not promised. And I remember my mom used to always say, if, when I asked her, mom, are we going to do this tomorrow? She would say, Lord willing. And I was like, why are you always saying that? You know, we're going to, she's like, because we don't know, you know, that that's the plan, but it could change. It could change literally overnight. So that's so very true that you really have to seize the day and seize the moments that you have in front of you because you don't know where tomorrow is going to bring you and what's going to happen at that point. I'm just so thankful to God that you said yes, because you are, you are planting seeds still on a, on a global level to so many people. And there are so many lives that were waiting for you to show up. They needed what you had, what was deposited in you. And it had you been swallowed up in the grief to the point where you couldn't function, then those people in your kingdom assignment would have never been reached. And when you went before the Lord, you would have had to answer for that because there is no excuse, you know, because God is, God has borne our sickness. He's borne our disease. He's carried our grief and our sorrow. So even in all of that, that's why the Bible says we don't grieve like the world because the world grieves with the sense of this is over. This is the end. There's no hope. But for us, we understand that death is just the end of one existence but it's the beginning of something else mm -hmm. and so that's why you're able to say there's life and death and people in the world are like what are you talking about your parents are gone you crazy you need to be on meds yeah we need to get you on some meds but you know what you're talking about because you're speaking in the spirit so i just want to just thank you again for saying yes <laughs> to this interview and I, I want to do something a little different, um, and I hope I don't put you on the spot, but I'd like to end with prayer. I just feel like whoever's listening um, and connecting to your story, I just want them to know that there's someone out there that not only has been through what they've been through, but someone is praying for them mm -hmm. and mindful of them. So if you wouldn't mind just, just giving a word of prayer, and then we can end. said something very key. We don't grieve like the world grieves. Mm. And I think that's the best way to say what I've been saying all along. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's process is different. Yes. As a social worker, we learned, you know, you, there's these stages and steps mm -hmm. in, the, in, in the grieving process. And, you know, there are five steps, but then they tell you each person might go through those steps in a different order. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you go through those steps. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I tr it, it, and, I'm, and now I, f I, I, I realize why I haven't fit in any of those steps. Yeah. Because, you know, one of those steps require denial. The yeah. other step is anger. Yeah. The other is depression. And yeah. then you go through all these steps and then the very last is acceptance. Right. Um, and I haven't denied anything. Mm -hmm. I, haven't, I haven't allowed myself to be angry. Okay. Um, I would have liked to have go under a rock and probably wallow in what would be depression. Mm -hmm. But it's almost as though, like I said, their, their passing gave me so much light because at that moment, I understood that, mm. man, purpose is real. Yes. And for as long as you live in there, still something left for you to do. So you got to try and figure that out and then get on it. Yes. And so, you know, if nothing else, I want to pray for those that are grieving mm. because, you know, grieving it is a process, but you don't, we, we don't grieve like the world do. Yeah. And, um, we, we really don't. And I'm an example of that my, myself and my brother, because we don't, you know, there's nothing in that steps that includes kingdom principles like faith. That's true. There's nothing in those set, steps that include the Holy spirit. There's nothing in those steps that include joy. Yes. And so, you know, I think I may, we, we may have just redefined 
what true grieving is. And it's not saying that we're not human, mm -hmm. um, but before we're human, we're spirit. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Father God, we thank you so much for each life, each air, each heart yes, that's yes. listening and that's opening to the sound of my voice. Father God, we thank you for the word of wisdom, knowledge, understanding that you've given me to give to these people. Father God, we ask that you will be the comfort, you will be the joy, and you will be the strength of every broken heart and every broken spirit in the name of Jesus. Yes, Father yes. God, you said that you would never leave us or forsake us. And Father God, we know that you are here no matter what. Whether we believe it or not, Father God, you are here. Mm -hmm. Satan, you have no control, you have no authority over the citizens of the kingdom of God, or even those that are wayward. They do not belong to you in the name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you for the smiles. We thank you for the peace yes, that passes all understanding right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, we ask that from one minute to the next, Father God, a tear will now become a smile. Mm -hmm. Father God, some fear will now become feast. Uh, yes, fear will now become peace in the name of Jesus. And that cry will now be joy and laughter in you and in your presence, God. Mm -hmm. God, I thank you for the love that you have shown me. Thank you for, the, for, for, for just being who you are, that God of love your everlasting love that you surround us with right now, Father God, we ask that, I just ask that you will show that love to any and everyone that's broken, that's in need. You would perfect any concern right now in the name of Jesus. And Father God, I just pray a blessing over everyone right now. I pray a blessing over their life and every purpose that is to be set forth, Father God, we send it on deployment Jesus. right now in the name of Jesus. For each of us is to impact Yes, a life yes. and is to impact the world and impact the communities that we live in. But Father God, we cannot do it without you and we will not do it without you. So in the name of Jesus, Father God, we thank you for all you are about to do and all you have already done and set forth in the name of Jesus. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Amen.